Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of General Conference Conversations. I am your host, Kaylin, and I'm super excited to be here with you today talking about the words of Christ's chosen leaders. So let's get right into it. I am back. We are back. It's been a crazy couple of weeks, <laughs> and it actually worked out really well to take the break when I did, as usual. Everything is just falling into place, but I'm excited to be back. Um, excited to talk about this talk with y'all today. Um, just some housekeeping. We are getting into the Sunday sessions. So, um, of course, we've still got about a month and a half Oh, two months, <laughs> two months of episodes to go before we finish um, April conference, but it's already almost the end of January. So that means October conference is right around the corner, which is so, so insane <laughs> that it is creeping up on us, that it's already almost August. That's so crazy. So, um... It's looking like the season will end somewhere around the end, the, the middle of September, just to give you kind of a, a ballpark of when all of the episodes for this season will be out. And I have a couple of other announcements that I'll talk about closer to the end of that date and everything like that. But today we are discussing Elder Christofferson's talk, One in Christ. And as I said, this is the very first talk of the Sunday morning session. Um, and this was a really good talk. I really enjoyed it. And I think I have some interesting things to talk about and discuss some personal um, experiences, conversations that I've had recently with family. So I'm excited to, to dive right into this. Um, of course, before I do, as always, I encourage you to watch, listen, read this talk before you come listen to me talk about it um, so that you can get your own inspirations and questions and promptings and direction for how to study this talk for yourself. And hopefully I can add something with my questions or my experiences um, when you come back. <laughs> but I'm gonna jump right in. Um, as you can probably tell from the talk uh, title, and of course, if you've read the talk, you know, or you can probably tell that this talk is all about unity. And this is a theme that I'm trying to like think about this conference in particular. Like I've, I mean, I've taken a break. So I'm like trying to think back to all of my notes from the last, you know, few months. Um, not on the off the top of my head that I can think of like whole talks about unity, right? From this conference. But I can definitely think of a couple off the top of my head from the last several you know, four or five conferences, talking about unity, being one in Christ. Um, Elder, or President Nelson, I believe it was his young adult um, devotional that he gave last year, last um, spring. We talked about the our identity as children of God as being kind of the most most important and that should, should be the most important in our lives. Um, and Elder Christopherson kind of goes off of, not no, not goes off of that, but it's along the same thread. Um, of course, we're talking about unity. We're talking about being one in Christ, one in a common goal, common deed, right? And I'll get a little bit more into that. But he starts by talking about, well, he mentions it's around Easter, of course, this is right around Easter. They're talking about Holy Week. And um, at the end of the Last Supper, Christ um, gave his intercessory prayer. And just for reference, that's in John 17, or the one, at least the one that he quotes here is John 17. And he prays that the apostles 
will be one as he is one with the Father. And he um, then goes on to say, you know, not just for my apostles, but for all who will believe on their word, that they will be one in me as I am one with you. And um, he gives some examples about being one, being a uh, becoming one as a reoccurring theme in the gospel of Christ um, and and in God's dealings with his children. So he gives a couple like Enoch and the New Testament um, in the Doctrine and Covenants um, and a couple of those. And he uses the phrase God prevails. And that's kind of the the unifying topic, right? You think about other organizations or businesses, usually organizations, but businesses as well. Um, when you're part of something, a group, a production, um, you're all moving toward this one goal, right? Um, you have an organization that advocates for I don't know, healthcare, <laughs> like whatever it may be, you advocate for, um, why am I like totally blanking on literally anything else? You're advocating for, um, hunger, you're not advocating, right? Like clean water in country, in third world countries. That is the goal that you're all working towards, right? You all have different roles within that organization, whether you're just you know, whether you're a volunteer, or you're an organizer, or in a leadership position. You're all doing different things, have different strengths and weaknesses, different jobs, different um. I'm, sort of, I'm like totally blanking on the word that I'm trying to think of. <laughs> But, but you're all working toward that one goal. And as people in the world, and especially as, particularly as members of the church, our goal is to let God prevail. Our goal is to become like Christ and come closer to him and to God. And so he, um, he asks this question, which of course is very poignant. In our extremely contentious world, how can unity be achieved, especially in the church, where we have to have one, where we are to have one Lord, one faith, one baptism? And he goes on to quote Paul in <clears throat> Galatians. He talks about, Paul talks about um, as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, that there are, is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, you are all one in Christ. And as the, like I just said, that is our, our thing that unites us, right, is our common goal, our common friend is the Savior. And as we are united in putting on Christ, whatever, what all of that entails, right? Becoming like him, that will be unified. Um, and I really liked this. He kind of, there's not like a half and half, but the first kind of part of his talk after talking about this, he talks about being one within ourselves. And I really liked that he added this or had this part in his talk because it starts with us. And sometimes, and he talks about this a little bit later, or he quotes President Nelson talking about this later, and I'll quote it again. But we can't control other people, right? Um, we can do our best to be working towards becoming more like Christ 
and we can encourage others and try to, you know, bring the spirit into the situations that we are in, right? Um, and we can we can do our best in that way, but it's really us. We can only control ourselves. And so I liked that he had not just that. It what he talks about that later, and I'll get to that of just like we can only control our own actions. But that he went through and actually talked about becoming one in Christ within ourselves as well. And so it just it gives me a lot of comfort sometimes to be like I can't control the world around me. I can't control people. I can't control my husband, my family, my friends, my neighbors, whatever. But I can control myself. I can better myself or I can work on bettering myself. I'm not perfect at that, but we're working on it, right? I can I can set goals for myself. I can be aware of when I'm not at my best and try to be better. And in a world that doesn't that I don't have a lot of control over and also as a person who has a lot of anxiety who has anxiety <laughs> and who struggles with loss of control of not knowing what's going to happen what somebody is going to do being able to step back and say but I can control my reaction to the situation I can control my actions in this situation and so to be reminded of that specifically in a spiritual sense especially in a spiritual sense right um that that was it was just really good it was really really good and it made me think of a a, a couple things, a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of things. He talks, but I'm going to sum up a couple of things he like mentions in this, just this few paragraphs right here. Um, he talks about that we are dual beings of flesh and spirit and that sometimes we're at war within ourselves, right? Our spiritual and our physical the parts of our souls are sometimes at war where our physical body wants or needs and sometimes in conflict with what our spiritual what our spirit wants or needs um, and finding that balance and finding you know obviously you still need to eat right there are physical things that you need to do you can't sit around and read scriptures all day that's just not physically possible you have to eat, drink water, um, but finding that balance of I need to feel my emotions to like in a healthy way to process my emotions, feel my emotions, um, even express my emotions in a positive, healthy way, but then not to dwell on them and remember that I have hope, that I have faith, that I have a savior who loves me. And so that's really what he talks about. And he specifically says, drawing upon the light and grace of Christ. And that is something, because he talks about spirit, he talks specifically that Christ was also a being of flesh and spirit. He understands that. He knows what that feels like. He literally came to earth and was a human being, flesh and blood, and felt what it felt like to be tempted and to be hungry and thirsty and need to take care of your body and your spirit and your mind to have that balance and so we can not only you know know that he knows what we're feeling and thinking but also that he overcame all of that he can help us that it's not all on us. I was talking to my mother-in-law. Um, my husband's family was here last weekend for a couple of days and we were talking about the gospel. We often get into very long conversations <laughs> um, and it's great and I love it and she was talking, I don't remember what we were talking about specifically, but she talked about how 
um, there are just some things, some phrases, and I've noticed this as well, that just don't work for her. Like, that's just not how her brain works that we often use in the, in the gospel. And one of them was like, take care of your own salvation, right? Um, we understand the concept of that, right? Is that you're taking care of yourself. You're you're focused on you can't you can't save everybody else. That's Christ's job. But often it comes across as, well, you just gotta do it all yourself. And she's like, No, no, no. Like I can't do that all myself. That's not that's literally the whole point of the atonement is that I can't I can't save myself either. I can't save everybody else, but I can't save myself. And so what is so helpful for her is to be reminded that we need to lean on the Savior, that the Savior is there. And I know that we were talking about repentance at one point, that, you know, the way that I was taught repentance as a youth and as a primary child, um, or at least the way that I remember being taught it, was very scary of this like oh you did something bad so you have the you know the five steps of you have to admit that you did something wrong and then you have to tell somebody and you have to apologize and you have to go to your bishop and then you have to tell god and like all this stuff right you have to pay restitution you have to like make up for it like it was just this massive list of things you had to do for something big that went wrong and then so you're terrified to ever do anything wrong which is like good on one hand, right? We're trying not to do things wrong, but inevitably we're gonna make mistakes and we're going to do things wrong and we're going to have to repent. It's not a backup plan, it is the plan. We are meant to fail. We are meant to fall down and then get back up with Christ's help. And that was something that I remember, like, I don't remember being part of the conversation about repentance for some reason. And maybe it wasn't the teachers, like, maybe it was just, you know, my child youth brain not making the connections, right? Um, it wasn't until I was in the MTC that I truly understood how repentance and the atonement connected. I knew that, that was like, oh, I repent because of the atonement. I, I can repent because of the atonement. But I never understood really how to use the atonement in my life and what that meant and like how that actually worked, right? Um, and I lost my thought. <laughs> Sorry, I like had a couple of things else, a couple other things I want to talk about. Anyway, so and in you know and in being in the MTC and being a missionary, I saw that I saw that, and I I had to learn and I had to remind myself that I can't fix everything for people. I've met a lot of people who are going through really 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 hard times, really rough circumstances. I couldn't help them. I couldn't I couldn't fix it. I could sit there and listen when and love and give hugs and comfort. Um, but at the end of the day I had to I had to give it up to the Lord. And I had to refer them to the Lord. Refer is a weird word to use in that setting, but like refer them to the Lord. Be like, he can, he can understand. He can help. And that's such, uh, that's such a comfort for yourself to be like, I have the Lord and I can rely on the Lord. And also in settings where even if somebody is not religious or whatever, you know, you can pray for them. You can, you know, comfort them with the peace that you have. And so I really, really, really appreciated him specifically talking about how, you know, we each begin within ourselves and we're trying our best 
and um, we're drawing upon the grace of Christ. We are with his help. Um, and going off of that, um, actually I'm going to move on. He talks about moving on to unity as a group of people. And then I'll talk about the last couple of things that this whole talk kind of made me think of. So he talks about, well, the first great commandment being to love God. And then um, he goes on to talk about unity as a group, as I said, and he says this. Unity with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ grows as we heed the second commandment, inextricably connected to the first, to love others as ourselves. And I suppose an even more perfect unity would obtain among us if, if we followed the Savior's higher and holier expression of this second commandment, to love one another not only as we love ourselves, but as he loved us. In sum, it is every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. And I, <laughs> that's such, so beautiful. And it's so like, it can be really overwhelming to think, well, I have to love everyone perfectly because Christ is perfect. And obviously that's not true. We're not expected to be perfect, but that that is the unity that we are searching for the unity of a faith in Christ, the unity of hope, the unity of love, that we are loving and accepting of everybody. Um, and that's not, we're not going to be perfect at that. <laughs> we're not, it's not an easy thing all the time, right? Um, but it's amazing and <laughs> it's doable. Um, so he talks about, he, um, uh, shares a story about B.H. Roberts, who was a um, member of the First Council of the Seventy, what we would refer to as the Presidency of the Seventy today, and that he, he, he um, ran for, so sorry, he ran for uh, United States Congress and didn't ask first. He didn't ask, like, he didn't um, talk to the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles before he did so. And he ended up losing and he felt that it was in large part because um, Joseph F. Smith had um, kind of called him out for it in a priesthood meeting and that like just whatever he um became very critical of church leaders and he withdrew from church service active church service and um he was able to kind of he was able to come back from this he was able to have conversations with with the other members of the presidency in the 70 that he had had kind of contentious conversations with in the past and kind of put all that kind of contention behind him and um elder christopherson says this since we can also see in this example that unity does not mean simply agreeing that everyone should do his or her own thing or go his or her own way we cannot be one unless we all bend our efforts to the common cause it means, in B.H. Roberts' words, submitting to the authority of God. We are different members of the body of Christ, fulfilling different functions at different times. The ear, the eye, the head, the hand, the feet, yet all of one body. Therefore, our goal is that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Unity does not mean, mean require sameness, but it does require harmony. We can have our hearts knit together in love, be one in faith and doctrine, and still cheer for different teams, disagree on various political issues, 
debate about goals and the right way to achieve them, and many other such things. But we can never disagree or contend with anger or contempt for one another. And I wanted to talk about this. There's so much in this quote. There's so much to unpack in these two paragraphs. Um, first of all, that there is a common cause. We still have a common cause. Um, we're all going to be going about it in different ways, um, but that we are, there is one thing that we can all agree on, right? That we should all still be working towards that one thing, um, which can be hard sometimes, um, especially when it's something like loving everyone, right? That, I don't want to say it's hard to love everyone, it kind of is sometimes. Not in the way of like, I hate all people, right? But like when something happens, when you have a legitimate concern, a legitimate situation that happens with someone who hurts you, who you disagree with, who whatever, right? Or abusive situations, things like that. It can be um, really hard to love everyone and right like to we are human and we're not going to be perfect in becoming like christ but it's in the the act and the effort of becoming like christ that that is where we are unified and so i like that he kind of reminds us of that and then he also a little talk talks about unity does not require sameness but it does require harmony um we can knit our hearts together in love, be one in faith, and still cheer for different teams or disagree on political issues or debate about goals, but we can never disagree or contend with anger or content contempt for one another. There's also there's always this oft one of those another one of those oft quoted phrases, right? Contention is of the devil, contention is not of me. Contention is not of God. And I think sometimes we equate contention with conflict. Um, conflict, when used correctly, <laughs> when actually, you know, used well, can be good, right? Debate is good. The, the, the discussion of ideas and, you know, in, in political arenas, in just daily life, um, bouncing ideas off of each other and disagreeing you're going to disagree with people we're not all the same and so we're going to we're going to disagree we're going to have conflict we're going to have friction in relationships between people that is normal but i like that he says disagree or contend with anger or contempt for one another when that conflict turns from we're disagreeing and we're trying to both have our opinions heard and have a discussion and a conversation when that turns from that to just throwing insults and it devolves into contention you're not just disagreeing you're not just having a conversation you're not just yada 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 right you are fighting and that's not useful right you're not getting anything done with that kind of whatever and um and so i like to to remind myself that of the difference between contention and conflict that one is good and and, and, and can be useful but when it taken too far and devolved into contention that's not it's not useful not useful at all um and of course like he's uh he mentions again that we are not all the same we're not all going to be achieving the goal in the same way we're not all bringing the same things to the table and he quotes president nelson from a couple of years ago or sorry a year ago um his talk the power of spiritual momentum when he asked us to root out 
contention in our lives. And he says, uh, none of us can control our control nations or the actions of others or even members of our own family, but we can control ourselves. And I was thinking about, I had a, I'm in the Young Women's Presidency, and we had a, a meeting last night, and it's hard. It's hard. It, church callings in general are hard, right? You never feel like you're doing enough. I never feel like I'm doing enough. I always feel like I should be doing more. I'm, I'm missing out on something I'm doing. I'm not doing something I'm supposed to be doing. And particularly the last couple of months, it's summer. And so I've been in and out of town. The rest of the presidency has been in and out of town. All of the girls have been, all of our girls have been in and out of town. We've had FSY this week. We haven't had, we didn't have a meeting. I wasn't at a meeting for two months. We didn't have a meeting for a month and a half. Um, we don't have activities during the summer for July and August because people are just so in and out. You can't pin anyone down. And so I felt, I felt very disconnected. Um, I mean, we've had class, but not all of us have been there. And like, it's just been a lot. Of, it's been very disjointed the last few months. And, and even before that, right, it's just hard. It's hard to know if you're making any sort of impact with these girls. It's hard to know if you're doing things right or wrong, or if something you say is going to affect them in a good way or in a bad way 10 years from now, right? That's a lot. You can put a lot of, I put a lot of pressure on myself as a leader. And there's a couple of things that happened in this meeting. It was a fantastic meeting. We ended up going for like two hours, partly because we hadn't met in so long and partly because we just got to chatting. And our president, who I absolutely adore, I will sing her praises till the end of time. She, um, she was looking at our, we have our, our roster of girls and then also all of the leaders on it. And she said, she's like, I got down to the list of all of our leaders and I thought, man, these girls, she's like, I am so lucky to serve with you. And these girls are so lucky to have you in their lives. And then a little bit later, we just had an advisor called, or she's been called for a couple of months now, but it still feels very new because we haven't had meetings and activities and everything like that. But um, she was talking about, you know, trying to get to know her girls. She's the advisor over the middle group of girls, middle age group of girls. And <clears throat> she was like, she said something about, she's a teacher. I can't remember what she teaches, but she's a teacher. And she was like, I have to remember sometimes to put my teacher voice aside. Like I have to kind of separate the teacher part of me and all of us there's a couple of a couple of girls a couple of the women on, on our presidency was like well not always right like like yes that's fair you're not gonna you're not their teacher you're not their teacher at, at church their advisor you're supposed to be there as, as a mentor as a leader um but sometimes they they need that and I was, it, it made me think of something that I've talked about on this podcast a million times, things, things I've, I've, I've thought of so many times and I've been reminded of by a very gracious God <laughs> when I feel that I am being inadequate in whatever I am doing. I have been reminded that I am where I am for a reason that I have been given the skills and the experiences to be where I am for something. And even if I can't see it at that moment, um, there's something in my personality, in my skills, in the way that I think about the world and events and whatever, the ways that I think about the gospel, the ways that I think about people, the skills that I've picked up, very practical skills like organization and writing and whatever and also more abstract skills like listening and things like that um, and experiences that I've had in the past have all culminated to be where I am right now and so 
you know, in this calling, I have been called to this calling, probably because they needed to fill it, right? But that I was called to this calling, me. They called Caitlin Bates as the young woman's secretary in this ward right now. Whether that is to help a specific girl or the whole group, or if that's to help my presidency, fellow presidency members, whoever I interact with in this calling, right? There's something that they need that I have. And like, not in a prideful way, right? Like, well, only I can fill this calling right now. But like, that brings a lot of comfort of like, well, even when I feel like I'm being the most terrible young woman secretary in the entire world, right? Like I, I have something, I have something to offer. And, you know, we have a couple of teachers, a couple of the, I don't know, like half <laughs> of our presidency are teachers. Um, well, the president and both counselors well, the president, one of the counselors, the president's a teacher, one of the counselors just retired as a teacher, one of the counselors is a principal, and then one of our uh, advisors is a teacher, the, another of our advisors is a teacher's aide. So, like, we have a lot of very similar skills, right? And having those experiences and skills help them to be with the youth because they know how to speak to youth they know how to speak to the girls and also you know having those teacher skills can come in very handy um that's something that i i learned as a missionary um that and i had to and that i reminded a lot of my companions about often was that you know i wasn't just called as a missionary I, it wasn't just because they needed a spot filled, which they did, but also I, I, Sister Guthman, <laughs> now I'm using all of my names, I, Sister Guthman, he called me as a missionary in Mesa, Arizona, in the wards that I was in, interacting with the members and the non-members that I interacted with, with the companions that I was serving with, with the roommates that I lived with, with the the, the districts that I was in, the zones that I was in, all of it was orchestrated so beautifully and perfectly by God. Because he knew what I needed, he knew what those people needed, he knew what companions needed, like, so many things, right? And it just blows my mind. <laughs> um, and... And it's so it's a great reminder that we can't control other people, but we can control ourselves and that we have something to offer. Um, we can't snap our fingers and have everybody around us happy and joyful and get rid of all of the disagreements and conflicts that we're going to have, but we can try. We can put effort into being more unified in ourselves and our families. And so that's my question. My one question for you for this whole talk is how can you foster? It's kind of a two-parter. I will give that. How can you foster unity in yourself and in the relationships in your lives, in your life? It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be easy. Start with yourself. And, and and then move on to it and it doesn't have to be big things right as I say all the time my motto is work smarter not harder what can you change not necessarily add but maybe you change the words that you use when you're talking to a family member the tone when you catch yourself snapping and try to not snap like it and I know it's hard it's hard when you're in the heat of the moment to stop those things and to step back. Um, but I know you can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> so how can you do it? How can you foster unity in yourself and the relationships in your lives? And of course, to end his talk, he reminds us that it is only through 
Christ that we can that we can become one within at home at church eventually in Zion and above all with the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost that Christ is our Redeemer and that through it's through him that we become one and that's I go on to remind you as you're thinking about this question how can you foster unity in yourself and relationships in your life how can you bring Christ into that how can you um, add him <laughs> and lean on him and ask for his help in doing so um, as for further reading further study footnote 24 um, I've said this before I'm sorry to say it again pay attention to your footnotes footnote 24 he has a little bit of ex more expansive of the story of B.H. Roberts, if you're interested in that. And then he has two, well, he's a talk, and I believe it's an Ensign article. The Price of Peace by Marion G. Romney in the Ensign, October of 1983. And then The Power of Spiritual Momentum by President Nelson, which is April of last year. And I did an episode about that one. It is not on net on YouTube yet <laughs> it is a podcast um but if you're curious and or interested in hearing my thoughts that was my very first season so don't judge my <laughs> i don't know audio quality or something like that i mean it's not good anymore now either but anyway um but yeah if you're reading that and, and wanting to i don't know have more thoughts on the subject um there is that but that's all i've got for this talk for you today uh, but thank you so much for watching and or listening to this episode as always you can find me on instagram and facebook and um you can follow me over there you can follow me on your podcatcher of choice subscribe on youtube i always like to I try to respond to and I love to read comments and messages and emails and whatever other ways that you want to have conversation conversations with me. I, I very much enjoy all that will be linked in the show notes for you if you're interested. And I will talk to you all next time.